Welcome to the Dental Code Advisor Podcast, hosted by Practice Boosters coding experts, Dr. Charles Blair and Dr. Greg Grobmeyer. Interpretations of the CDT codes represent the opinions of our experts. For the latest CDT codes and official interpretations, contact the American Dental Association or visit ADA.org. You are responsible for your own use of the CDT codes. Tune in now for timely information regarding dental coding. Hello, and welcome to the second episode of the Dental Code Advisor podcast. I'm Dr. Greg Grobmeyer, and I'm here with a true authority on dental insurance, Dr. Charles Blair. Dr. Blair, how are you today? I'm doing just great, and I'm really looking forward to our second podcast today. I know, it's exciting. Last episode, we found out where dental codes come from and how they're updated from year to year. So if you missed out on that one, be sure to check it out. In this episode, we'll begin delving into the topic of PPOs. Now, preferred provider networks are a popular way for dentists to get their name in front of a large group of potential patients. And they're so popular with groups and businesses, they're sold 14 to 1 compared to indemnity plans, which have no preferred network. There are trade-offs for the dentist, however, so each provider needs to weigh the pros and the cons of participating in a PPO network to see if it's a good fit for them. We're going to discuss many of the concepts that you need to be familiar with in order to make an informed decision about PPO participation and how to properly work within the guidelines set forth by the plans. First, let's talk about being out of network or not participating. And I think there's this big misconception that when you're out of network, that the rules don't apply to you, that you can just code however you want to and that chart notes aren't as critical and so on. And that's just simply not true. Well, I totally agree with that. And the coding is the same. In other words, we've got to report what we do. And like the ADA says, you know, uh, report what you do. So if I do a pan and bite wings, I cannot report that, for instance, as a full series. I've got to report it as a pan and bite wings because that's what I did. Absolutely. I know even with the uh, cone beam and things like that, you're taking, when you're doing a bite wing mode set, even though you're collecting four images worth of information, it's really just two images. And so you have to, sticking to code what you do, you're really doing two images. That's correct. You may have four bite wings worth of information as an example, but yet if it's just two images in this illustration, it would be, you know, two bite wings. That's right. correct. So you're still having to absolutely make sure that your coding accurately reflects what it is that you actually did. And your chart notes are going to be critical too, because even if you're out of network, you can still get reviewed. You can still have somebody come in and checking your chart notes. There's all the legality that's wrapped up with that and making sure that you're not liable for anything. The chart notes are critical to being sure that you're staying within the the law. Yeah, we can't emphasize that enough because you want to get better reimbursement. You want to have less hassles with insurance companies. Uh, You want to be bulletproof if the state board would review your clinical uh, activity and so forth. I just cannot emphasize enough there the clinical notes. And another bigger trend that we see in the insurance uh, industry is that the payers are wanting to look at the notes. Remember that a, a narrative has no legal basis. Narratives are written a lot of times by the staff, which is legal if they have done uh, that's assigned to them and they write the uh, narrative uh, for the doctor, but it's based on the clinical notes, then, hey, that is fine. But the clinical notes are what's so critical to make sure that they are absolutely correct and reflective of what was actually done, because that's the buck stops here. When those when those narratives are reviewed and they go back and they look at the chart notes, if those things don't match up, then there's trouble. That's right. Well, even though coding is the same, uh, when you're out of network, one of the massive perk is that you're not having to write things off. That's right. You don't have to write anything off, but remember that there are some you know repercussions here. I always get my full fee, but the EOB may make me look bad and the patient uh, loses uh, faith. Well, the insurance company said so-and-so. Dr. Blair said so-and-so. I'm going to believe the insurance company. I'm out of here and so forth. Remember, too, that patients, when you're out of network, you're still subject to complaints with the Consumer Affairs Division under the Attorney General of the state. Patient can always make a petition to the board whether you're, you know, in network, out of network. The advantages, of course, is that you can charge the patient the full 
practice fee, but do not inflate any fees to take advantage if the if the PPO fee schedule is higher. That should be a wake up call. If you find that the mm. PPO fee schedule is higher than your schedule, than your full fee, then you need to kind of relook at things because that's uh, generally the PPOs are 30, 40 percent below where you need to be. So that's where you're talking about doing fee increases across the board, but you can't just inflate the fees for that one particular PPO knowing that your fees don't match up. That's not okay. That's right. We need a consistency and we don't want to play the game. Well, Delta wants this and Guardian wants that. We need a flat out, you know, fee schedule. Here's our full fee schedule that goes on the claims. And the only exception would be if I gave a discount to the dental assistant's husband or my preacher comes in, then that is legal. If my regular fee is 1000 I want to do it for 500 then then that is okay. But 500 would go on the claim, not absolutely. You have to report what is actually charged, not your full practice fee, when you give a discount. Correct. Now, it's not necessarily true that patients are going to be taking a hit if they're out of network. That's true. Because what happens is that the payer determines basically what their philosophy is. Some payers say the dental aspect is 4% of our total medical uh, budget. We want to give, you know, Cadillac coverage, so to speak. And if somebody wants to go out of network, we're going to cover it very, very nicely. On the other hand, uh, sometimes the payer says uh, we're going to really hurt the employee that goes out of network. We're going to reimburse at 50% of the level, as an example. So that's why you need your due diligence. That's why you analyze these things, Greg. And it's not just an automatic uh, yes, no. You've got to really look at the individual PPO and how it's mm-hmm. out, out of network You know, reimbursement is. So you can't assume that it's going to be worse for the patient, but you can't assume it's going to be better either. You're going to have to look at each individual plan and see how it stacks up against what your practice is doing. And you're in serious trouble if if it is a EPO, exclusive provider organization. What that means is the employee must go in network or they get zero. So the patient's got to really love you to come to you and get paid zero. So if it's an EPO, then you're not going to have many patients coming in. That's something that I think a lot of uh, administrative team is not necessarily aware of the existence of. They're telling patients, and uh, it's good to tell patients that sometimes you can still come in if you're not in network. We can still see you. We can still file your insurance. May not even be that much difference. May being the operative word. You've got to keep track of it. But if they have an EPO, that's not something you can offer. If you're not in network, then they will not benefit from you in any shape or form. That's correct. Yes, sir. And I don't think a lot of uh, administrative teams are aware of the existence of an EPO. So you can't just blanket say, if you're not in network, you can still come to us. You need to find out what they have. You have to look at their plan. You have to be aware of what it is that they're coming in the door with because you do not want to misrepresent yourself and come off looking bad. But there are ways to kind of get around patients being out of network and still attract them to your practice. I know there's a, a, a few things that you suggest to still promote the practice to those out of network patients. What are some of those things? Well, one would be, of course, a in-house discount plan. We don't have time to even go in that direction with this podcast, but in the future, we will give you a real rundown on how in-house discount plans work. I think every practice should have it. The caveat is don't make the discounts too big. That'll all be discussed at a future time. Another thing is you could get a healthcare attorney involved. It could be that you could have a specific fee schedule for XYZ manufacturer in your community, it would be a lesser fee schedule than your standard, but it would be above, you know, if you had joined the PPO. So the bottom line is get a healthcare attorney involved, but that may be a another alternative is to honor these patients coming in with a fee schedule that's just a little bit above what they're really going to have to pay out of pocket. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a legal protocol to be able to to do a separate fee schedule for a particular company or for a particular. That's right. There. And the caveat, though, is get that healthcare attorney to 
sign off because, gosh, all of these state laws, they're just all over the place. And I want to caution anybody that this can be a good technique in certain locales under certain you know, under certain parameters and guardrails. And so we, again, say that you really need a healthcare attorney there to look at the fine points. Absolutely. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about being out of network and how that affects providers. But when you're in network, there are some things that I think a lot of providers are not aware of. Basically, you've got two kinds of PPO plans, and some are governed by the state statutes, some are federally governed. And I want to talk about the two different types there. Would you tell us a little about that? That's right. And basically, when a patient comes in, just kind of picture this that's stamped across their forehead. There's two categories of patients that have insurance, whether you're really in network or out of network. In other words, that plan that is set up, uh, there's what we call insured plans, And that is going to typically be less than half of your practice that do have insurance. And how it's different here is that the insured plan is basically an individual. Ms. Smith gets her own plan or it's a small business. Joe's Machine Shop has 10 employees. They buy a plan and that plan is bought from a insurance company. The insurance company is at risk. Now, this is under the state insurance commissioner. It's under all state laws. Like I said, it's typically, though, less than half. So we got one set of rules, so to speak, if it's an insured plan. And then the other type plan is a self-funded plan. Now, this fee capping for non-covered services, there's 40 states that have adopted this. This protects you somewhat with the insured plan people coming in. There's 40 states that have said basically... If the insurance is not covering that service, then you can get your full fee. And so a lot of people erroneously, doctors, teams, think, oh, our state has this law, so we're protected. That's correct to whatever the degree and however that is written. And the definition of a non-covered service can vary, but they are protected on the insured plan only. But the self-funded plan, that state law that they have is worthless. It does not affect self-funded plans. They're under federal law. Examples would be a large employer, hospital chain, union, Wells Fargo Bank, and so forth. Typically, what they want to do is they hire a third-party administrator, the employer does, for a couple of three reasons or so. One is that an actuary will design the plan to the employer's budget. They may want a cheap one there, Greg, or an expensive one. Provides a low-cost network of doctors. And then the TPA, the insurance company, has no risk. They process the claims, say five bucks a claim. So the self-funded plan is set up such that the employer funds quarterly a trust account And then the insurance company writes checks. So when you get that check from MetLife for Wells Fargo Bank or whatever, then that is not MetLife money whatsoever. Not one penny is. It's the employer. And this is why it's so critical that on appeals and where we want the patient involved uh, of just where do they go. So just recapping that, because I think that's so critical of a distinction to make, you have fully insured plans, which are basically being insured by money that's coming from one of the big insurance companies. So those are fully insured, small businesses, things like that. That's part of your practices. Those fall under state laws. Things like that fee capping law apply to them. But the big companies, your Federal Express, your Walmart, your Bank of America, the, the things that are, are kind of national companies, if they're coming in with insurance like that, those things are actually funded by funds from a big old trust that's set up by Walmart or by Bank of America. Those That money is not coming from the insurance company. The insurance company is only acting as a third-party administrator. They're getting paid to handle the claims, and that's all. They're not worried about the payout. But those particular companies fall under federal law only. So fee capping, that doesn't apply to them. That's not something that you can just assume doesn't happen to you if you're in one of these 40 states. 
which those 40 states, most of the ones that are uh, without a fee capping law are up in the um, northeast United States, plus like Hawaii and for some reason, South Carolina. I don't know why it's carved out, but you need to check with your state board, figure out whether you're one of these states that has fee capping laws and realize that those fee capping laws only apply to fully insured plans, not self-funded plans. That's right. And the Dental Society is the place to go there. You could even talk to the executive director about your particular, uh, if you're in that 40 state uh, umbrella of uh, the specifics there. Also, a lot of teams say, well, how do I know which is which? Well, when you call in and ask the insurance company, they will quickly tell you if it's a self-funded plan or an insured plan. Also, if there's any kind of identification card or an employee booklet, Usually it has some code words on the back page or on the reverse of the identification card. It's going to say something like administrative services only, guardian, or it may say administered by MetLife. So tell me exactly what fee capping means. When does that come into play? Well, for instance, I turn in an implant to the insurance company. They pay zero. They say, we don't cover this. Dr. Blair, you've got to write off $400. So what they did is they didn't pay one penny, but yet they control my fee and they forced me to write off something. Another is it could be that the patient needs a third profi and the insurance company says, well, uh, we only pay for two a year. This is a patient responsibility. But by the way, you've got to do that profi at the PPO fee level, not at your full fee level. So those are just some examples. Absolutely. And there may be some particular circumstances where services that you provide, you're not even allowed to charge for at all. I know that in certain circumstances with all on four and things like that, it becomes questionable whether it's Can a service, you you, it? yep. wh- whether you should even offer it, you know? That's right. Well, a, a key is, is looking at that PPO EOB. You never really know. You can do all the prior approvals till the sun sets, but they always come back and say that this is an estimate and is not guaranteed payment at all. So you don't really know until you've got the EOB in hand, you've got the uh, check in hand from the insurance company, and then you've got to very carefully, carefully read it because the PPO can deny a procedure. That means For instance, I turn in a cone beam, they come back and say, we're not covering that, that's a patient expense, or they can disallow something. Maybe I turn in pulp caps plus a filling today in conjunction on the same service date. They come back and say, our processing policy doesn't permit that. You're a member of our PPO, so you must write it off. So those are examples, or another one may be, hey, Doc Blair, you did a filling here, and this filling has uh, failed within two years, and you've got to do a new one at your expense, not the patient's expense. So those are just some examples. And those are things that are all laid out in that policy processing manual. Now, we're probably kind of running short on time for this podcast. We're going to pick this up again in our next podcast and talk a few more things about PPOs including contract requirements and that policy processing manual, how to review it, what to look for, what handcuffs are, things like that, coordination of benefits and some other stuff. So that's going to be another very informative podcast. And I hope you guys are able to tune in for that one. I've enjoyed our conversation today. I think it's been very informative. I hope everybody has gotten something out of it that they can take back and put into practice on day one. Yes, I agree. And it's been a pleasure again to present the podcast. And next time will be really exciting because as we move into the podcast uh, part two of the PPO, we're going to be talking about some of those handcuffs and things that are in either the contract of the PPO or its processing policy manual. Looking forward to it. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. This podcast is brought to you by Practice Booster, an e-assist publishing company. To learn more, visit dentalcodeadvisor.com.